want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, uh, this is uh, one of a series of fundraisers that Wisconsin Green Fire is um, putting on, and part of it is to help um, people be aware of the organization. Um, just for background for myself, um, I've worked at the DNR in Madison for more than 35 years. Um, started when the first groundwater law was enacted. Um, I worked on revisions to the spill law. Um, I worked on environmental cleanups. And then when I left in retirement, I was working on managing the program that financed municipal water systems and the replacement of, of lead pipe. So a kind of a wide range of, of, um, of, of interests. Um, but I also worked there when um, I would say science was kind of demoted as a priority for the agency. And so to me, Wisconsin Green Fire is um, the one organization that really brings together a wide range of career experts into one house, um, continue their passion for conservation and resource management in Wisconsin, but it also incorporates um, others who have just a passion about Wisconsin's environmental heritage. So it's really a nice blend of expertise and um, regular folks who just care about preserving um, the environment. Um, but I want to point out that there are one of the things that makes, to my mind, makes Wisconsin Green Fire really special is um, the fact that they do have people like Mike Kane, who really is the DNR lead attorney on wetland protection and the public trust doctrine, and people like Paula Liberty, who is a water resource expert on issues in western and northern um, parts of the state, and, and Jimmy Vandenbroek, who's here today, who's, who's a nationally known expert on soil and water conservation, at Paul Heinen, who gets us a seat at the table in, um, at, in Madison because of his background serving as the legislative liaison for the DNR for so many years, and he's highly regarded. So you take people like that, and then you take people like Fritz and Kevin and Dave, who you know really um, have dedicated much of their lives towards conservation, um, and then other people who really just care about the environment. And it makes a, it makes a great organization and a fun organization and an organization that just produces some really good products. So um, I just want to welcome you all here. Um, I hope you guys learn a lot and, and I hope that we have some good dialogue because I think that's part of this is hearing from um, you know, what folks across the state have to say about their concerns and about um, the needs that we have in Wisconsin now and in the future. So um, Kevin, I don't know if you want to add to that or? Yeah, I'll just offer my um, welcome to you as well. And uh, I, I see several faces and names I, I recognize. My name's Kevin Kino, a research wildlife biologist in La Crosse area for, for several decades, uh, kind of retired now, but um, still in the game as well. But I just wanted to add um, to the opening comments, if you haven't had a chance to look at the wigreenfire.org website, please do that. There's a lot of great information about the organization and the work uh, promoting science-based natural or natural resource management. And, uh, you can learn about the breadth and talent and experience of both the board members and the staff. Um, there's uh, information about uh, how to support and join working groups. And uh, you'll hear some examples of some specific issues that some of those groups or working groups are taking on uh, tonight. And um, there's also a, a great archive of, of newsletters and documents on the site. And uh, the past newsletters offer a real nice glimpse into the development and accomplishments of the organization as well. So again, welcome and uh, enjoy the evening. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Kevin, and thanks, Robin. Um, and good evening, everyone. I'm Fred Clark, and I'm the fortunate, uh, have the fortunate job of being the executive director of Wisconsin's Green Fire, which means that I really get the pleasure every day of working with some really talented and really dedicated people who have taught me a lot. Uh, and I think we really work throughout the state of Wisconsin to maintain the leadership position that Wisconsin has earned in environmental conservation. And, and that's really the mission of the organization. Uh, I'm going to take just a couple of minutes and give you all a bit of an overview about Green Fire and our work. I'm going to try to do that concisely and not uh, uh, 
not muck it up, but I'm going to make this look hard because even though I share my screen and give presentations regularly, it, every time I do it, it seems like I make it way harder than it has to be. So forgive me for that. Um, but I'm going to share my screen here. And show this uh, little slideshow. Here we go. And we're, we're holding these events around the state uh, virtually, as you can see, but we really we're looking forward to the chance to reach out to both our members and, and people in Western Wisconsin who um, maybe know a little bit about us, but would be interested in learning more. So we're, we're glad that you're here. Um, we're an organization that's four years old. You'll hear a little bit tonight about our origin from our president, Terry Dalton. Um, and, and also about the work we do from some of our other members. But our, our mission is really to support Wisconsin's conservation legacy. We're a membership-based organization. Uh, we've got almost 500 members that range from uh, a large number of career experts and in, in, in disciplines ranging from water and air to forestry and wildlife. Uh, but our membership also includes a lot of people who just care about this stuff. Um, regular citizens from all walks of life who, who understand and value natural resources in Wisconsin and, and support our work equally. Uh, and and we welcome you all to be members and supporters of Green Fire. <clears throat> uh, we fulfill that mission through a pretty wide variety of activities, but most of our work uh, today is focused on policy. Uh, we have a part-time policy liaison, Paul Heinen, who spent his career working with Wisconsin DNR and now is our face in the Capitol, uh, talking to legislators, uh, working with us, with leaders of state agencies, uh, but really helping people making decisions on policy understand the science and the background behind natural resource issues. Uh, our members, from a wide range of, of disciplines uh, spend time testifying on natural resource issues, such as uh, Tom Hoagie here in the upper right, who uh, with over 30 years in Wisconsin DNR, including as the chief of the Wildlife Bureau, uh, now uh, is one of the people who heads up our wildlife work group. Uh, or Jimmy Vandenbroek there in the lower right, who's also with us tonight, uh, was formerly a county conservationist in Vernon County, uh, also formerly a career uh, manager in the Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection and, and works very actively in our agricultural issues. Um, but it isn't all about the experts and, and we're also very committed to bringing young people into conservation um, and including especially non-traditional students, uh, students of color, students from a variety of backgrounds who, who in the past may not have been welcomed um, in the traditional conservation fields that so many of us came out of. So we're, we're organized in a, a, really a constellation of work groups focused around different issue areas. And, and it's a really where we channel our expertise. Um, that includes work in energy policy, work on, on public lands and forestry, work on wildlife, uh, fisheries, uh, we have a very active environmental rules group, which is really the group that primarily focuses on uh, things like agricultural uh, management, as well as uh, industrial and water quality issues um, around the state. And we also have members who are scientists uh, who have worked on climate change and who really help us look at the aspects in which climate change affects almost all the issues that we work on from a conservation standpoint. Uh, we have a very small staff, including myself, our assistant director, Nancy Larson, who's on the call tonight, uh, Sarah Peterson, who's our science director, Paul Heinen, who I mentioned, um, Ruth Ann Lee, our part-time administrator, who we share with the Wisconsin Wildlife Federation, and our uh, communication specialist, Anna Hawley. But with a, a pretty small team, we, we're a really efficient organization because we're, our main mission is to really capture and help utilize the experience of our members. And I'll touch briefly just on a 
trio of issues that, that we've really dove in deep on this year, just to give you a flavor of, of the work that we do. Um, one of our big focal issues right now, as a matter of fact, is on gray wolves and the recovery of gray wolves uh, here in Wisconsin and the Lake States. And, and as I'm sure you probably know, the Fish and Wildlife Service has, has issued a delisting order for gray wolves that will take effect early next year. Um, one of our big focuses is to help set the table for the right policies here in the state of Wisconsin to help us manage a wolf population that now exceeds a thousand animals um, in a way that's sustainable, that, that keeps us out of this roller coaster that we've been on for years with listing and delisting. And that really takes advantage of the fact that we have a substantially successful recovery of this incredible species here in Wisconsin. That, that works being led by, uh, among others, uh, Adrian Whiteven, who's the co-chair of our wildlife group, who for over 30 years was the wolf biologist for Wisconsin DNR, uh, along with Randy Jurowitz, and Jody haber sinekin and Tom Hauge, and our science director, Sarah Peterson. We just uh, yesterday released uh, this issue paper, Creating a Shared Vision for Wolves in Wisconsin. It includes a policy playbook that we are strongly advocating for. We encourage you to check that out on our website. Uh, another area that we've had a real focus this year with leadership from our assistant director, Nancy Larson, is on the issue of oil pipelines. Um, as many of you know, the Enbridge Corporation, which maintains oil pipelines in the state, has been uh, looking for permission to reroute their, their line five, which is the line that runs through northern Wisconsin and the upper peninsula of Michigan um, and through lower Michigan, uh, uh, so that they can avoid the Bad River Reservation uh, for which their easement has expired. We've partnered with Midwest Environmental Advocates to uh, really help develop, well, develop a set of guidelines and information pieces for citizens in the area so they understand their rights um, around pipeline permitting and routing issues. And so we also understand that the obligations of, of pipeline operators like Enbridge, uh, so we can hold their feet to the fire. And uh, Nancy, with her background as a water quality manager in DNR, has really helped us spearhead that effort along with our other members. <clears throat> Final example issue I'll just point to an area where Green Fire has a lot of depth is on what we call uh, natural and working lands related to climate change. And I, I know this isn't news to most of you, uh, but when we look at our needs to get to uh, net carbon neutral here in Wisconsin, which the state of Wisconsin's committed to uh, by virtue of being a member of the US Climate Alliance, along with all of our neighboring states now, um, we know that one of the most important strategies to help get to zero carbon emissions is to optimize the role that our forests and our farmlands and our conservation lands play in offsetting greenhouse gases. And Green Fire uh, and a number of our members are really involved in those issues. We have membership in the Wisconsin Initiative for Climate Change work groups for both the forestry, agriculture, water, and wildlife. Um, and we're working to advance understanding of that issue and how important it is uh, to, to make that a key part of an overall climate strategy in Wisconsin. So uh, with that, I'm gonna stop yakking for a minute and we've got a small group tonight, which is great, uh, but we really wanna open it up to you all for questions, ideas, suggestions. Uh, or anything that, that comes to mind while you're spending an hour with us tonight. <clears throat> Bad jokes are, are welcome as well. And, and, and Fred, just to, just to kind of add on to what you were saying, um, you know, like what are, I'm curious as to what people think are really the critical issues for the western part of the state too, because I know that Green Fire is um, you know really looking in a number of different areas. You touched on just a few, and I think that you know every region has its own has its own geography and geology and, and hydrology, and so there's um, there's really issues that are unique to each geographic area. Uh, 
Robin, I might add to that that um, last year we submitted several uh, sets of comments on the Cardinal Hickory Creek transmission line, um, you know, and Carrie Beheeler really headed that effort. So, um, you know, we've been looking at issues that are particular to different parts of the state um, that come, come forward to us. So we've been watching that issue as well. Maureen, you're muted. Yes. Maureen, you had a question, a comment. Well, I could be brave or foolish enough to get started only because I know that Carl Green is here also. And whatever imprecision I give you, Carl could back up with, <laughs> with knowledgeable, <laughs> knowledgeable information. Right, Carl? Uh, Right. I, I, I'm Maureen Friedland. I'm a county board supervisor, um, and I, I'm on the Health and Human Services Committee, also on Public Works and Infrastructure Committee, and I, I also happen to be a, um, a board member of Midwest Environmental Advocates, so I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned MEA. I was on a call last night with, with Michael Kane. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I wanted to say that as far as issues are, are, are concerned, the county is about to begin engagement of its um, comprehensive plan that has to be done every so often. And um, land use planning is going to be a big issue. W one of the uh, r recurrent um, issues that that we have that that the that the um, uh, health department has been trying to deal with is is nitrates in the northern part of the county, uh, well contamination and and so forth. And um, some of the some of the solutions of that perhaps come from good land use planning. And and you just mentioned how important that's going to be land use for um, uh, um, uh, mitigating the effects of, of climate change. So I, I, I don't, um, I, that's going to be a field that we're going to have to study and learn about. And well, plan for. You, uh, I, I, did we pay you to ask just the right question for this audience tonight? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and actually, Jimmy Vanderbrook and Dave Vitrano in, in just a minute are going to talk a little bit just about that issue exactly. And, and because it is a, one of the key focus areas for green fire. So um, stay tuned on that. But I, I think your experience as a county supervisor wrestling with these issues is, is a really important one. And I, I wonder if we could ask you to follow up kind of where you see the biggest challenges or information needs right now from your standpoint? Um, well, I, I don't know. We, we've we spent the last couple of years just getting information on what exactly uh, the is the degree of problem that we have. And unfortunately with, with COVID, um, we've had to set aside a lot of the investigation, um, you know, mm -hmm. other other things to, to, to deal with. Um, so maybe Carl can answer that question better. Um, you know, I, I think that there's this struggle between, you know, La Crosse County is a, a urban and rural county and the county board represents both urban and rural areas. And so I think there's a hesitancy sometimes of the um, rural areas to maybe understand too much to you know and and i think that what what we have proposed um is better sampling and and to really be able to articulate where the um nitrate issues are are emanating from and and what the problems are and yet i also hear a hesitancy and uh well if we find out that it's ag which i don't have any doubt but if we find out that it's ag then what you know, and, and so there's really that, that sort of dichotomy, I think, that makes it difficult. And, um, you know, how do, we, how do we work through that? And, and I, you know, in regards to the land use as well, um, and the relation with climate change, I think there's a lot of people that, that think, yes, we need to, to 
uh, reduce our emissions and to figure out better ways to handle um, you know what's going out in in our CO2 and yet they're not putting together the fact that where they live and the style of development that um, that La Crosse County among many other counties is a part of is really adding to that because we're creating this infrastructure that's auto dependent that puts people in single occupant cars every day and they're not seeing sort of that bigger picture of the impact that that has. So I, I think it's it's kind of twofold. It's it's how do we balance that dichotomy of our rural um, constituents and our urban, as well as getting the people that are urban but want to live further and further away from the urban center to realize the impact that that has. I don't know if, if I'm overstating anything there, Maureen. But. No, that's that's great. And, and Carl has done a lot of work on um, developing information for people to understand that because their taxes may be a little bit lower, a little bit further from the city, that they're still not that they're still not overall coming coming out ahead. Um, he's been in, invaluable for for us as a technical expert. <laughs> You know, Thanks, Fred, if I could jump in, I, I would like to uh, just mention, I'm Terry Dalton, the board president for Green Fire, but our climate change work group, uh, which is headed by Nancy Turek, uh, has, she's been working on uh, workshops and materials for local governments. And uh, one of her things that she's been doing, and she's actually also works with the county extension agency, uh, working with counties on planning for climate change. And maybe there's some opportunities to think about these land use plans that are periodically updated and trying to build some partnerships to uh, help you. Uh, you've got your own experts, but sometimes it's helpful to have more folks coming in on a team like that. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, know Nancy, I, I can reach out to her. That's, I'm glad to hear that she's involved in that matter. You know, that's an area that, that with Nancy's leadership, we, we really feel like is an important one to develop. You know, you, I think a lot of communities are sort of inventing on their own wheels right now what planning and resilience around climate change looks like and making a lot of the same mistakes. And there's a lot of opportunity for co-learning and to really help develop some uh, more consistent ways of addressing climate threats. And, well, maybe with that, it is a good time to, Jimmy, ask you and, and Dave to just offer some comments uh, about agriculture, about our work there, and about the vision for kind of a sustainable landscape that I know you both have been working on. Uh, <clears throat> Who do you like to take the first swing at the sh with the shillelagh? I could do that. This is Jimmy Vandenbrook. Yeah. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about ag and, and Fred, I think you might have my little four slide presentation. Um, if you don't, it doesn't matter. No, I, I got it right here. I'm gonna open that up. Okay. Well, I. I I went to, wanted to go to this right away because, um, you know, Maureen and Carl were talking about the nitrate issue, and that's one of the big issues that uh, uh, Green Fire's um, been working on. Um, and yes, indeed, you will likely find that agriculture is going to uh, pop up um, in the proximity of your exceedances of the nitrate standard when you do your sample. At least that's, that's uh, typically what we found. Um, this is just showing the sources of nitrate in groundwater. Um, I should also mention that, and again, I, uh, you, know, you were directed, uh, I think Robin mentioned the, um, the website's got lots of links to what the work groups are doing. Fred mentioned it too. Uh, it's, a, it's a good resource. We have some of our papers that are, you know, describe the problem in the state, uh, what the recommendations are, 
a lot of them are fairly straightforward. They all deal with land management, of course, that, that difficult nut you were talking about, Carl. You know, how do you, um, you know, once you find out you're, you're dealing, you're gonna have to talk to the egg folks, um, you know, what do you, what do you say? And I think that's been a challenge that we've all had. And one, one of the reasons um, I'm now involved with Green Fire in my retirement is that this is an assemblage of uh, all the science folks, DNR, Extension, Department of Ag, uh, that have dealt with the science, but also with uh, the policy. And that's where this has to go. It has to go uh, ultimately to policy, but that means you've got to bring, we've got to bring agriculture along. And that's been one of our biggest challenges. And frankly, in my career, um, I, I would say the only success I had is where you get that gap with groundwater was with a regulatory program related to atrazine. And we regulated it and we were quite successful. Uh, but guess what we are not able to do with nitrate and with a lot of the other issues. Uh, it's, it's been very difficult to effectively develop any regulations. There's incredible resistance to it. Um, but I think often we focus a little bit too much on farmers themselves and we forget how things have changed very dramatically in the state. Um, here, this, this slide just shows about the fact that we've we've not made, we're not making progress with nitrate and groundwater. The, the state's um, uh, groundwater coordinating council issues an annual report, it's a great report. And it's showing that the base flow uh, in streams, uh, nitrate's increasing and, and that's because it's in groundwater and it's discharging the streams and we're seeing that increasing over time. And just one example, this one from Chippewa County shows this was a great set, data set, of wells that they sampled uh, beginning, you know, uh, uh, in 1985 and then through to, you know, then again in 2016. And essentially it's showing uh, the trend is towards in increasing concentrations in those wells over time. So we've got a problem. And my guess is you will find a problem too. Uh, and it may be not as bad as some counties, but I'm sure that you will find it. But that data is very important because, and I I'm glad, was glad to hear you're talking about connecting up uh, you know, your health department with the sampling program, probably your land conservation office is involved too. They're the ones that are gonna have to work with the farmers. That combination of your health department, land conservation office has been very powerful in other parts of the state uh, in conducting these, uh, these well sampling surveys, often with uh, in coordination with uh, Stevens Point that does uh, sampling surveys. We've got uh, extension involved. But it's a, it's a powerful thing because that data is very immediate and it's very local. And people do care about their water and you'll find that that will stimulate the conversation. Um, and I'll kind of wrap back to agriculture when I get through these slides. And basically you're showing we've got a problem in the state. Uh, the driftless area of the state is challenged by its topography. Um, it's steep there, um, water runs off fast. And most of the phosphorus load goes in a, a very small number of calendar days um, during the year. And it's, in the spring is the worst. And of course, that's often when, when uh, the soil is its most fragile. So uh, maybe the last side, slide, Fred, and then I'll just get back to some of these issues. So the trends in egg uh, are that we're seeing uh, soil test phosphorus has increased since the 70s, and now it's bouncing around around 50 you know, parts per million, which is beyond the optimum for row crops. So it's, we've got a source of phosphorus. The only way we're gonna deal with it is to manage it, uh, manage the runoff. And an indication that we're failing at the job is the bottom uh, graph here, which shows sheet and rill erosion 
which declined in the mid 90s and now has climbed back up to before we started analyzing for this, this is actually USDA data for Wisconsin, shows our average soil erosion rate is now higher than it was in 1982. And so, uh, and the latest date in 2017 is about identical to 2012. So we're, we're not getting ahead of the game here. Our, our runoff is higher than it's been, and we've got a source for runoff and phosphorus is a problem. Uh, for surface waters and the sediment that ends up in Mississippi and its byways and everywhere else is not good either. So that's the end of the slide spread. And so I'll, I just wanna say that, that these are the issues we're working on. We've got recommendations for how to move forward policy wise, but I wanna come back to farmers real quick and then we'll, we'll switch it to Dave. Um, green fires, and I, the Green Fire has uh, come to the conclusion, I would say, in our internal discussions that, you know, we can talk with farmers or we can talk at farmers, but if the other key players in the food supply system aren't part of that discussion, we are not going to get anywhere. And that means we have to be talking to the, the major players, the uh, fertilizer companies, uh, the the crop advisors, the processors, you know, the milk processors, the cheese processors, all of those folks are the ones that are driving farmers to produce stuff for less than the cost of production, which is why we subsidized, last year subsidized um, agriculture to the tune of 40% of their net income. That's a lot of money. And it's money that could be used much more constructively uh, to stop the problem on the, you know, on the land and to, and to make farmers uh, profitable again. And we can support uh, different styles of farming. And we need to reward the farms that are already doing a good job. And I would say that in the Driftless area, um, there are many examples of farmers doing a really good job. And that's not reflected in the price of their product. And we have to figure out how to reward them and to incentivize other farmers to, uh, you know, the rest of that supply chain to support farmers to do the right thing. And that's, that's one area where we're, we're moving forward. So if you have any other questions, well, let's hear, maybe hear Dave first and we can take them after that. Okay. Um, I'm Dave Vitrano. I was a fisheries biologist for DNR for more than 33 years and I've been living in this part of the Driftless area for oh, over 40 years. Originally a Milwaukee native, came over here and decided that I was pretty much done moving. Um, the Driftless area, we all talk about the uniqueness of it and I just want to kind of give a little short story and then kind of tie it into what some of the other discussion has been. Um, the driftless area, as most of us know, lacks drift. It was never glaciated, and so pretty much everything in this part of the state is unique to the rest of Wisconsin. So when we talk about management in a driftless area, it has to be viewed within that lens. Um, at the time of settlement, and I'm going to talk about this as a fisheries person, but at the time of settlement, um, these streams that we had here, and I mentioned streams because if you want to know the health of a watershed, you go down to the, uh, the body, the nearest body, water body, and that'll tell you everything that you need to know. The, uh, the streams here at the time of settlement uh, were full of brook trout, and they ran narrow, very, uh, uh, very clear, very cold, and uh, were an amazing fishery. Uh, when the, with the advent of the European settlement, mostly in the 1820s, land use changed that. And it was because these weren't the, the people who came here brought with them the technologies that were appropriate in Northern Europe, uh, but not necessarily so for the driftless area. And in, 18, in the 1880s, dairy farming became the main industry in the driftless area and it remains the main industry today. Uh, by the 1930s, with, with our topography, the only uh, row cropping that could be that could occur would be on the ridgetops and then in the valleys and so the hillsides were what they 
used to graze all of their cattle. Well, the combination of cattle on the hillsides compacted the soil, denuded the vegetation, and it created almost an impervious surface where rainwater and snow melt couldn't percolate down into the ground. And so relatively shortly, uh, soil erosion started to occur. And by the 1930s, it was occurring at a rate that was, you know, comparable to what was going on with the dust bowls. Um, the, the soil we have here is a lush soil, and it's a the wind-driven material came off the glaciers. Uh, it's very fertile. However, when it gets wet, it has a consistency of melted ice cream, so it becomes very fluid, very easily eroded. Well, with the combination of the hillside grazing and up and down row cropping, um, the soil erosion was occurring at a rate of uh, anywhere from four to five inches of sediment was eroding off the hillsides each year, filling in the valley floor. So by the mid 30s, there was literally 12 to 15 feet of sediment in these valley floors. Um, not surprisingly, the fishery uh, suffered because the, uh, the habitat was lost, the uh, spring flow that had been feeding these streams had been interrupted because there was very little groundwater percolation. And uh, so there was a, a pretty much the brook trout fishery was wiped out. Uh, when I came here in 1980, uh, there had been years of stocking, mostly of brown trout, which for those of you who know about brown trout, they're kind of, like, kind of like carp with spots. They live in water that no other well, self-respecting trout will spend any time in. Um, but they can tolerate those warmer and uh, uh, temperatures. And so when I started here in La Crosse, in 1980, most of our streams were uh, put and take heavily stocked streams. Um, by the time I retired in 2010, they were almost all self-sustaining. Uh, a big part of that was the, an aggressive habitat program that we had, also a wild trout program. But the big part of this, and this is how I'm gonna tie this into some of the previous stuff, was uh, the 85 Farm Bill. Uh, when the 85 Farm Bill came out, it was a time of uh, pretty bad uh, economic depression for, for the agriculture industry in the state of Wisconsin. And there was a lot of farmers who could not raise crops. They could not rent their land. They could not sell their crops and they were going out of business. Federal government came in with the 85 Farm Bill, including things like cross compliance, which meant that somebody who received any kind of sub subsidies had to have and follow a conservation tillage plan on their farm. And also the conservation reserve program, which idled up thousands and thousands of acres and put that into perennial, uh, uh, perennial cover. By the late 1980s and early 90s, we started seeing uh, for the first time natural reproduction occurring in our streams. We also started to see more base flow, more spring flow, colder water temperatures, and a total regime change on, on, on how the, the, the cold water fishery in this part of the state was. We were seeing the same thing here. Minnesota and Iowa were also seeing the same thing. So it wasn't just, it was a literally a region-wide, a driftless area-wide uh, um, phenomena, if you will. The, what was happening was, is that as the, the perennial vegetation, it became very clear that perennial vegetation was the moving factor between more groundwater percolation and that colder base flow and those colder water temperatures. So it was obviously land use was the big change. Uh, by the time, I, well, right now, dripless, uh, trout fishing in a dripless area, in the entire dripless area, is now a $1.6 billion industry compared to a zero industry not that many years ago. Somewhere along the line, I got involved with um, more of a regenerative agriculture, and I saw it as a way to protect my trout streams, to encourage landowners to fundamentally change how they farm and convert their previously row crop ground to more perennial vegetation, grasses and forbs, and to do intensive managed grazing on these streams. And I've been an advocate for that for a long time. I see that as one of the best ways to address the issues that Jimmy brought up, that what Maureen talked about and Carl talked about, is to get the, to take care of some of the groundwater issues, some of the um, soil erosion issues, and some of these other uh, things that, that are plaguing this part of the country. And I think the time is perfect with the uh, pandemic. There's been a lot of people who are starting to look at where their food comes from 
and starting to make the connection that <clears throat> having food grown and distributed, you know, 1,500 or 2,000 miles is not necessarily the best thing as compared to having it grown more locally and reducing that sphere. So um, I'm using the trout fishery as an example of, you know, we get tied up in the gloom and doom very easily on these things, but this is a, was a case where things are actually much better now than they were not that many years ago. And so I think that if we work together on this, there are things that we can do to turn some of this around and, and address some of the issues that all of us are facing. So. Yeah, thanks, Dave, and thanks, Jimmy. Uh, thoughts or suggestions, welcome. So Fred, I wanted to just comment one thing that I was really excited about with Green Fire is their emphasis now on um, having that student uh, participation from students from campuses throughout the state, I try and get involved to kind of um, uh, bring them into the Green Fire organization, but also to get their perspectives and, you know, they're going to be our future um, in many ways. And so um, I just think that that's something that um, I never want to forget when we have these kind of conversations with people that, um, you know, Wisconsin Green Fire obviously has a lot of retirees, but they've also really um, dedicated a lot of um, energy right now towards building that student base and having that student participation. And I don't know if um, you or anyone else wants to maybe just spend a second or two um, talking about what the students are doing. Yeah, Terry, is that something you could speak to? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, we uh, started about a year and a half ago to try and formalize our outreach to students and young people. And Dolly Ledeen, who maybe some of you know uh, is from the Madison area, has kind of been leading our uh, efforts with the students. But we have recently uh, formalized that and we formed a stu uh, student and young professional work group. Uh, we have a, a core team of about, about eight students who are mobilizing to communicate across campuses, uh, across the state, not just UWs, but also uh, private colleges and universities. And one of the things that they're initiating is um, some social communications. Now this is, I'm gonna show my age here. Uh, it's like a newsletter, but it's not really, it's like a, a posting board. But anyway, the students are organizing this electronic media that's gonna <laughs> communicate to, uh, student environmental groups across the state and have monthly uh, kind of outreach to them. Uh, we've initiated a free student membership and we have a student member representing uh, that group on our coming to our board meetings. Uh, so it's, it's a, a beginning effort, uh, but we're really excited about it. We have um, one student from Stevens Point and a student from Northland College who are kind of co-chairing that new, our newest work group. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, we, we just really see the importance of, of making sure those careers are open to a wider, wider pool of people, you know, from Kenosha to Superior. But, but you know, for so long, these have been fields that, it, as you all know, have been dominated uh, by people that look like us. And there's a whole lot of folks in the state who, who value natural resources just as much as we do. And, uh, so if anyone here has some connections with students at UW La Crosse or other institutions that would like to shoot us an email with a contact name, we'd get our students uh, connected with them. So that'd, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a quite question about motivation. I really had never heard of this group until, re until recently. Um, does the state need um, assistance? That, that's, I guess, is a question that comes to my mind. I, I, um, what I'm trying to figure out is whether or not this organization exists because you really like to keep on doing what you used to do, which I get, or whether it partly exists because you don't think that the DNR has been functioning as a DNR for a long time and it needs a support from outside the government. Yeah. 
You know, Brian, that's, that's a great question. And we were, you know, formed in an era when the erosion of science in DNR and in state government was, was really a, just an acute problem. And we, we were feeling a need at that time, especially with an exodus of really talented people leaving the agencies. And with a new administration under Governor Evers, it was a question we had to ask is what's the relevance today of, of green fire? I think what we found since 2018 is that we are actually in demand more than ever. And, and I, I'm not just saying that because you know, it sounds good. The agencies now have lost so many talented people that the institutional knowledge that our members have is actually something that's really valued. So, you know, we, Jimmy is part of a quarterly call that we have with the secretary at DATCAP and, and his deputies. Um, because Jimmy and some of our other members were career employees there and have a lot of insights to offer. And we do the same things with folks in the forestry and the wildlife and the water bureaus at DNR. Um, and, and we provide a lot of insight to conservation groups who just honestly don't have the depth of knowledge that we do. So it's, we feel like most of the time we're, we're DNR's best ally. Sometimes we're poking at them when, when we think it's important to do that. But um, Nancy or Jimmy or others, I don't know if you have other thoughts to share. Yeah, I'd like to say something about that. You know, the, when I started with DNR, I started in 77. And what, the agency that I started with was a totally different agency than was when I retired in 2010. Along the way, uh, the, uh, the secretary became a political appointee, and that really became the, the start of things changing. And as Fred said, this group was formed at a time when science is really looked down on, and it's still needed because those same political influences are still there. And so there are people within the agency that because of the way it's structured now, do not have the freedom to say the things that they would like to say. So it's kind of up to us to say that for them. And, uh, and so um, I see, uh, you know, I know we have all kind of struggled with, all right, now there's a change in administration. Does that mean that the green fire is no longer needed? And as Fred said, no, I think we're needed even more than ever to, to make those changes. But I was sorely disappointed in the agency that I retired from. Uh, because when I started, everything was, you know, it was more important to get the job done than it was to make sure that the governor looked good. And, and that, was, that was a very hard thing for me to do. It's one of the reasons why I left when I did. I retired a little early because of people like me who like to uh, get things done, there was really, there was, at that time, there wasn't much of a place for us. So I think what we're doing here, we're trying to do in Green Fire is, as Fred said, I think it's far more important now than it was even when we were founded. And, and I can follow up, Dave, with that, just to give you kind of a more concrete example. Um, when I was at the agency and the groundwater law was being developed and we revised the spill law, they looked to DNR staff and managers at the legislature to provide them with their opinions about what the good things were or bad things were about various pieces of legislation. And um, when I can remember, not that long before I retired, where I went over to the legislature and all I could do, all I was allowed to do was to say, this is what the bill says. And when the legislators asked me, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I couldn't give an opinion. Yeah. And that's where yeah. Green Fire comes in because they can provide that kind of insight that DNR staff are no longer allowed to provide. Yeah. And if I can I, add, I, that's a really good example, Robin. And um, we actually are very um, guarded, very careful about describing ourselves as nonpartisan and being nonpartisan and being an independent source of information. And recently, um, Senator Coles, who's a Republican, um, head of the Natural Resource Committee in the Senate, um, basically gave us an, an, um, a testimonial for our fundraising, saying that you know, we're a go-to group for him. So we work with everybody. We let the facts speak for themselves. But it seems as though the problems have not been solved. I've been a little bit disappointed. The governor, I think, is uh, pro-environmental, which does sound as though you guys are gratified by that. But uh, David implied that there's still restriction on, um, David and Robin implied that there were still restrictions 
on scientists actually being real people, real scientists doing their job, that seems like a really serious problem. I, I wonder um, also about the legislature. Um, is the, the legislature is probably not changed much in terms of its position on environmental issues. And so even though the governor's, the governor has a different perspective on the environment, the legislature in general may not. And so that surely must also hamper the current uh, department. It's a big part of the problem right now, Brian, and, and something that the administration and the agencies really have to navigate carefully because the, the legislature right now controls their budget and yeah. they hold that over them. I think, uh, I think another thing that we uh, need to think about a little bit is that in our world today, we have a pretty divided uh, country in terms of how people in general view science. So I think whether you're in an agency or in a university or a nonprofit like ours, we have to really look to uh, the ways that we communicate our science messages. So the more people we have out there using compelling, informative messaging to reach across all the political boundaries and try to get people to re-embrace science in their daily lives. Um, that work, no matter who's in charge at the legislature and the governor's office, that work is gonna continue. We've, we've seen that even with the COVID outbreak, yeah. people are not listening to science and we, we need to think about how we can craft those messages to be more compelling and insightful to the public. Are you implying that maybe it's safer, it seems safer to people in the rural areas to hear from somebody who does not work for the government? I don't know if I was implying that, but I think it, it, is, it is another voice that they would hear. Um, I think it would depend on the individual, perhaps. And let me just let me just say something. When I started getting involved with the managed grazing, I used to go to farm groups and um, go to pasture walks and things like that. And I would never identify myself as a DNR employee because I really didn't want to go there. But when people found out that I worked for the department and they found out that there was actually a, somebody from the agency who looked at, at their type of farming as as something that was doable, they were surprised and and. And they were also happy that uh, it wasn't always the enforcement part of that. So yeah. I think that, you know, we've been siloed for a long time. And, and as, as Jimmy talked about, I think it's time for uh, groups like this to get involved with some of these issues, some of the rural issues with agriculture, not as, a, uh, as an enemy as what we've been viewed in in the past, but as, a, um, as somebody who can promote you know, uh, promote agriculture, certainly regenerative agriculture uh, over, you know, some of the other uh, conventional agriculture that's out there. So I think there's some opportunities, I guess, is what I'm saying. And, you know, when I used to go to rod and gun club meetings and that, you know, they're just like regular people. They just want to, they, they don't want to be talking down to, they just want to be talking to, they want to have their voices heard. And I think one of the things that happened when we became more top down rather than local control is that issues that I might have faced as a biologist that I could handle here, all of a sudden that authority was pulled from me. I was not allowed to make that decision to fix that issue that that one particular landowner had. It went to Madison. Well, the sheer volume, nothing got done. And so now you have a landowner that's not very happy. So I think that there is opportunities to work hand in hand with some of these groups that we haven't really worked with well in the past and stick with the science because that's the only thing we can really uh, hang our hat on. Once we step into the political arena, then we open ourselves up for, you know, all kinds of, uh, of uh, criticism. But I think that there's ample opportunities for groups with this kind of expertise to work with consumer groups, ag groups, political groups, uh, anybody who's interested in what's happening in the, in the resource and come to some kind of consensus. At some point in time, we have to quit poking each other in the eye and sit down and find some common ground to get some of this stuff done. And I think it's a perfect time to do that. And I, th I think the, the relationships and the sort of long uh, background that a lot of our members bring puts us in a position to be able to have those conversations. And Brian, really appreciate your questions because they're, they're critical ones. 
the other thing is, and I, I don't want to belabor this, but the DNR has also lost a whole lot of staff and they just don't have the resources available to do that kind of networking. And I see Wisconsin Green Fire as being able to fill a gap that um, used to be there, but you know, uh, for, for folks that used to be there at the DNR and, and who just aren't there anymore, they just don't have the staffing levels that they yeah. used to. So Green yeah. Fire, I think is, is becoming much more well known um, and able to serve in that capacity a lot better. Yeah. Really. As long as we stay non-political and we beca we can become the advocates that yeah. we really want to be, whether it be for DNR or, in my case, for farm groups or some of the other groups, be that person that speaks a different voice to you know to align ourselves with some of these other groups. Folks, we want to respect everybody's time tonight, and we've got to kind of wrap up the program part of it so we can have a little fun. But first, Alyssa, I, I want to thank you for providing atmosphere tonight with that beautiful, lovely fire. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, I, I'm going to just uh, make our request so we can get that part of the program out of the way. But um, partly, you know, we wanted to make you all aware tonight of what we do with Green Fire, and I hope that we've helped do that in the short time we've had want to encourage you to join if you're not a member already i know we already have some members on on tonight but if you're not a member please consider joining us we, we, whatever your background you are welcome in green fire um, and we also want to consider or ask you to consider making a gift to support green fire we we operate substantially based on the individual contributions of people just like you um, 500 and growing around the state and that's what allows us to do what we do and, and do a lot of what you've heard tonight. Um, this is the part of the program where I get to talk about the exciting match pledge that's been offered to us by one of our donors uh, to provide a one-to-one -one match for any, any gifts or contributions that anyone on this call tonight uh, is able to make between now and the end of December 14th. Um, if, if you can make a gift to Green Fire, your pledge, your gift will be matched one to one and, and your, your contribution will be doubled. And, and that is significant for us. I'm gonna make my own contribution to Green Fire tonight just to make sure that, uh, uh, that we can take advantage of that. But um, if, if, if you're called on to make a gift to help us out, we appreciate it. We will thank you as many ways as we can, um, bring you into the Green Fire family. And you can do that through uh, our website, uh, which we provided a link for in the chat box. You could do it by mail at our PO box in Rhinelander. Or if you have an old car in the backyard that you want to get rid of and you're willing to donate it to Green Fire, we can accommodate that now too. Uh, in which case, just send me an email and uh, we'll, make it, <laughs> we'll make it go away, as they uh, say in New Jersey. Um, so with... Yeah. Couple I, words. I think that's really important that um, uh, that because I don't think green fire is as, as um, it has not has as much visibility in this part of the state that that in addition to joining and growing our membership in this area um, also you know making other people aware of Wisconsin green fire and if people want to learn more about it that we're available to make these kinds of presentations and have these kinds of discussions um, and I think that's also really important um, because I think growing the membership in this area um, builds more strength for the um, issues that are um, unique to this area. And I guess I just uh, will have the few uh, final closing words. I think uh, in listening to the speakers tonight, you can tell that most of the, the they had a lot of passion for uh, the natural resources and for the the good work that people are interested in doing. And I think for me, one of the big things about Green Fire, it's three things that kind of come together. Um, creativity and passion for uh, a shared cause, and then the relationships that we have to build to solve these problems together. And uh, because Kevin uh, is one of the hosts tonight and is a, a good friend of mine from way back, I thought I'd share uh, three quick pictures that illustrate that point. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, so uh, uh, 
Kevin and my husband and I uh, worked on a loon project for many years. And uh, one of the things that I have to say about Kevin is uh, he is a creative guy and he works really hard. Uh, this picture is a little deceptive here. You can see my husband there holding a loon. Uh, that he's, uh, we actually had to hold this loon for 15 minutes, hold it still while a small computer glued onto its leg band. And my husband was getting a powerful thirst. We'd been working for many hours since dawn that day. Uh, but uh, uh, we didn't always make light. We weren't making light of our loon and the seriousness. But, uh, you know, what it says to me is, that uh, a group like Green Fire, we work together on uh, projects. Here's uh, Kevin taking that bird down for the ultimate release. Uh, and uh, there's the bird taking off, uh, heading out onto the lake. And to me, that's a little bit of what we're doing here uh, with Green Fire, is we're bringing together people that have a passion, a dedication, a lot of creative energy and like Margaret Mead said, a small group of dedicated people make all the difference. And for this loon, for example, that loon went on and retracted its migration back and forth to Florida. Uh, and I think uh, for those of you on the call, um, I'm sure you have similar passions for things in life. And we hope you'll uh, think about joining us, uh, look at our work groups, and uh, or just simply uh, become a member and keep up with us through our publications and emails, but uh, thank you so much for listening to us. And we also will have a really great time. Uh, it's important to have, have fun when you're working together. So that's one of the other goals of our group. And uh, with that, I think, Fred, we're going to stick around if anybody else has final conversation. But for those who need to take off and head on to other things this evening, we'd, we'd say thank you so much for listening to us. And please share information about us with your friends and colleagues and family. Yep. Likewise, thank you, everyone. And for anyone who wants to continue the conversation, we'll stick around for a minute. I have a question for Alyssa. Alyssa, do you, do you have a second? Um, so I'm curious, because you're um, with, Alyssa is a professor um, at uw Cross, And so do you see, um, uh, are there student environmental organizations there that might want to be hooked up with some of the student activities that they're doing at Greenfire? You're asking are there student organizations to connect? Yeah. Um, well, I know of clubs like a geography club and a biology club and a students for sustainability. Um, yeah, I think those those would be good to connect with. I'm not sure. Um, I guess the, the thing that I was going to suggest is uh, I have a capstone course uh, with students in all different majors, but all with an environmental studies minor and some kind of environmental interest. And I have them work with mentors for a semester in a capstone project. And often um, retirees are really excellent mentors and, and the students you know, work um, a couple hours a week on an ongoing project with the mentor. So it would just be working with one or two students for a semester. Um, and I do that every semester. So I, if you have projects where you could plug somebody in, um, you know, if it's mapping or surveying or um, it, now we're starting to do more things online so that, that could work perhaps with some of you in other places. Awesome. Happy to talk with you. All right. Hey, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to reach out. If, if there's a way we can help connect you with one of our members, we'd be glad to do it. Well, everyone have a have a wonderful holiday, a safe and healthy and uh, uh, enjoyable end of the season. And we really appreciate your taking time with us tonight. And thanks for uh, the hosts, too. Thank you so much uh, for helping us organize this. Thank you, Terry. Brent, thanks, for, uh, thanks for joining us, Terry. It's good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Take care, everybody. Glasses right. up. Hey. Have Bye. a good night. Bye. Bye-bye.